this past week, there were a lot of specials on television and a lot of special services around the world, especially out over the Atlantic, as we commemorated and remembered the 100th anniversary of the sinking of Titanic, April 15, 1912. The Titanic hit uh, an iceberg, and the bottom of the iceberg ripped open the hull of the Titanic, and the great ocean liner sank in a matter of hours, much faster than anybody had ever figured that a great ocean liner like that would sink. In fact, one of the reasons they did not have all the lifeboats on the, on the boat that they needed is because they had thought that there would be enough time for ships to come and be in the area, and they could just row people back and forth, they could ferry people back and forth, and they wouldn't need all of those lifeboats. But nobody ever thought Titanic would sink. Nobody would ever consider such a thought. In fact, it, it was, it, the designer was so confident that this was the safest ship that had ever been built. The captain was so confident that there was nothing in the ocean that could take on Titanic. In fact, one of the things that was going on was he was going too fast in the seas where ice was known to be. But he had more confidence in Titanic than he had in anything else. There were some who said that the Titanic was such a safe ship that not even God could sink her. And she didn't even make her maiden voyage. Years later, when Titanic was discovered on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, we found out that Titanic and the sinking had literally broken apart, taking to uh, the bottom of 1,500 people. Just over 700 survived. Why is it that this story, more than any other, holds our attention? Why is it that it is part of our uh, slang? No, if, there's, if we're part of something that we know is not going to end well, then we'll call it a titanic. Uh, if you get a promotion in a business that's not going to do well, then you just got first-class tickets on the titanic. Okay? And we, we all know that. Why? What's going on in your life? Well, I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm on the titanic, and we know what you're saying. It's part... It's part of us because there's something about that moment. There's something about that ship. There's something about the arrogance of everybody involved with Titanic. And there's something about the totality of the destruction that just hangs with us because we know that story, don't we? Uh, you can't say the phrase epic fail without thinking of Titanic because we have all been part of those moments when we were part of something that we were so sure was going to work out, so sure was going to be safe, so sure was going to save us. And then we hit some kind of iceberg and we break in half and we sink. It's what all of us have in common with Titanic. It's what Paul had in common with Titanic. And we read about it in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Stand with me in honor of God's word. We'll start reading right in the middle of verse 19. As Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days, immediately he, been, he began proclaiming that Jesus in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. But all who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man who in Jerusalem was destroying those who, were called, who called on his name? And he then came here to, a, uh, to take them as prisoners to the chief priest. But Paul grew more capable and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this one is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. But the plot became known to Saul. So they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him. But the disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. But Saul grew more capable, kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving this one is the Messiah. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Like the designers and the captain of Titanic, we think nothing can touch us. Like Saul before he became Paul, we think we have it all figured out and then bam, the iceberg hits and we break into pieces and sink. As you rescued Saul, rescue us. 
that we may know above everything that you are indeed the Savior. We pray this in your name. Well, Jesus had promised Paul that he would suffer for his name. That was one of the messages that Ananias came and brought to Paul, that you've been chosen by, by Jesus to be a messenger to the Gentiles, and you will suffer greatly for the name. And now it was just a matter of days. He's being run out of Damascus. He's being snuck out. They put him in a basket and lowered him down through one of the windows in the, in the wall of the great city, and he lands jumps out of the basket and runs to Jerusalem. If you read the paragraphs that follow, it's an interesting story. Paul goes to Jerusalem. He meets with the disciples there, but the church doesn't believe his conversion is authentic and nobody takes him in. Nobody believes him. So Barnabas has to rescue Paul from Jerusalem and takes him to Tarsus. It's Barnabas who hides Paul in Tarsus. He kind of puts him in a Christian witness protection plan. Why? How in the world does this man who was so strong an enemy of the church now become its chief spokesman? And isn't it strange that the church is the last one to believe that he's saved? Isn't that weird? Sometimes you come to me and say, hey, Mike, I was praying about this. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and this is what happened. Do you believe that? Like you're shocked God answered your prayer. Like you're shocked that maybe Jesus was paying attention. Do you believe that? Yes, I do believe it. Why is it that the church is the last one to believe that Paul was now a believer? You know they had been praying. You know the believers in Damascus had been praying about Paul. They had heard rumors. He's left Jerusalem. He's on his way here. We know what he's done in Jerusalem. And you know they're together going, stop him. Do something. Do something to this man. He's coming. He's going to destroy our family. He's out to get us. Help us, Jesus. And then Jesus does. But Jesus saves him. Oh, no, no, no. We wanted you to kill him. That was our prayer. Take him out, not bring him in. Some of us are praying, aren't we, for people we think are enemies of Christianity. We send emails to each other. Can you believe this? We need to pray about this. And we're praying that God will strike them by lightning, break them down, take them out. None of us are praying that any of them will be saved. Jesus says, I met him. I did what you asked me to do, church. I went and met him. And in that conversation, he is now a believer. And the last thing the church wants is Paul saved. Oh, no. What are you going to do with him now? So now this nice little boy who grew up such a strong believer is on, the road, is on the run for his life. And he spent the rest of his life on the run. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul gives a detail of how badly he was treated. Listen to this. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the depths of the sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city and dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brothers, labor, hardship, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, often without food, cold, and lacking nothing, not to mention the other things. I face the daily pressure on me of caring for the churches. Now, if you're a pastor, you love that last verse. Yes, being beaten and stoned and left for dead is one thing, but pastoring a church, that tops them all. <laughs> the obvious question is, how did a nice guy like Saul end up in a mess like this? You know the story. It's well documented told often. Paul tells the early church that, listen, if anybody had a reason to brag, I did. I was a Hebrew born of Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. Everything in my life was done exactly the way the law said it should be done. According to the scriptures, I was a Pharisee. According to the law, I was blameless. If anybody had reason to brag, I did. 
I was the top of my class. I was the young man that everybody watched. I received orders from the chief priest to go to Damascus so I could confront those people who were following this new thing called the way, who were telling everybody that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by God, and that was the proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, indeed the Son of God. And I spent my life trying to destroy this ministry, this new church. I had them put in jail. I had them arrested. I had their property confiscated. And yes, some of them even died because of my ministry, Paul tells the early church. And while he was going to Damascus, he confronts Jesus. Jesus steps in the way. You know the story, the, the blinding light, the voice that he hears that nobody else does, who tells him, why in the world are you persecuting me? Because if you persecute the church, you're persecuting me. It's hard, isn't it, to, keep a, to, to, to kick against the goads, to kick against the things. It's hard to fight truth, isn't it, Paul? And Paul is blinded by that light, and he stumbles into Damascus, and he's left by himself for several days. While there, while he is waiting to find out what to do next, Jesus appears to a young man named Ananias, a, a believer there in the Damascus church. He tells Ananias, there's a man waiting for you on Straight Street. I've told him you're coming. His name is Saul. He is now a believer, and I want you to lay hands on him. I want you to tell him he's been called to be my vessel and that he's going to pay a high price for being my messenger. That's what I want you to tell him. Ananias, I love this, says to Jesus, do you know who he is? As if Jesus is going to say, ah, wrong guy, I'll get back to you. Yes, I know who he was. You don't know who he is. I know who he was. I know what he did. You don't know who he is. And you don't know who he's going to be. So Ananias, get up now and go. So Ananias goes and he lays hands on Saul and begins to pray. And as he does, the scales fall off of Saul's eyes. And Saul now becomes Paul the apostle, no longer Saul the persecutor. And he begins to take the message first in Damascus. And when the, when the people in Damascus could not argue with him, could not defeat him in argument with the Scriptures, they did, they did the next thing. It's always interesting when you can't defeat somebody by fact or reason. You attack their person. It's, kind of, it's called an ad hominem argument. If I can't defeat what you're saying, then I'll attack you as a person. This person may be telling you the truth, but they're a bum. And because they're a bum, then it discounts what they're saying. It, 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 you, you'll see this a lot in the political discussions that's going to happen. We won't talk about facts or information. We'll talk about how lousy person the other, the other candidate is. That's what the people in Damascus were doing. They were now attacking Paul. And when that didn't work, they did the last desperate thing that people do. They made a plan to kill him. And so he sneaks out of Damascus. He runs to Jerusalem. The church there doesn't accept him. Barnabas rescues him, hides him in Tarsus until the church in Antioch needs a pastor. And then Barnabas goes to Tarsus and gets uh, Paul and brings him back. And there, while he is teaching and preaching at Antioch, he is called and he and Barnabas leave on the first missionary journey. You know how all of that happened. But you know, as Paul says, he spent three years in, in the deserts in Arabia trying to figure this out. You know he was going through his mind. How in the world did I miss this? What in the world happened that I, that I was so far off? It wasn't for lack of effort. He tried really hard. Over and over again, he documents all his credentials. He was the top of his class. He had the best teachers. He had all of the, uh, all of the degrees and all those certificates on his ego wall that any of us would want. But he had missed everything. Paul told the Philippians, I had everything that you would want. I had every degree. I had every rec uh, recognition, every accommodation. When I met Jesus, I realized everything I had was garbage. Refuse, trash. I threw it all away so there would be nothing in my life to keep me from knowing Jesus in the fullness of his resurrection. What in the world had happened? You know, I, I know, we recognize him, don't we? He would have been a great Baptist. Really, we would have loved him. We would have elected him chair of everything. 
He would have been the first one here at services. He would have been the last one to leave. He'd been the one who prayed the longest. That's how you tell if somebody's really spiritual, by how long they pray. <laughs> he would have known all the hymns. He would be able to quote the scripture. He, he would be one of our favorite teachers. We would have always wanted to be like him. But, for, but that was the problem. For Saul, it was always about what somebody else was thinking. It was a horizontal thing. Not a vertical thing. He measured his success by his relationship to each other. How far I am ahead of you. How close I am to you. How, how distant I can, I can be from you. How, how much smarter I am than you. How much more spiritual I am than you. Not how close I am to Jesus. Now, we always want to start, stop here and beat up religion. And there's a lot of articles now about going, forget religion, forget the church, just go hang out with Jesus, just follow with Jesus. The problem with that is, is that we're lousy doing this by ourselves. Okay, you always want to say, well, I'll just, I'll just go follow Jesus all by myself. Hint, the Lone Ranger had Tonto. Should be a clue. You can't do this by yourself. Life is too hard. The life of faith is even harder. You have to have brothers and sisters around you. There's a reason that you have to be involved in a small group. There's a reason that you have to study the Bible, yes, by yourself, but you also have to be with other believers. Why? Who's the first person you lie to? Yourself. You'll read a passage of Scripture and you'll say, that's an interesting teaching, but I don't have that problem. If you don't have some strong brothers and sisters around you going, oh, yes, you do. Don't you remember? If you don't have people around you who will hold you accountable for your follies and your mistakes and my stupid decisions, then yes, you will get into some very, very deep trouble if you do not have each other. There's a reason that Jesus chose 12. Of the 12, he chose three. Of the three, he had a best friend. He had a disciple that was closer than the rest of them. There's a reason for that. He has to be here together. Now, I understand why people get frustrated with the church. I understand about the bureaucracy. I understand about the politics. I understand all of that. Okay? And, and I get frustrated with it as much, if not more, than anybody. But that's not the problem, is it? Not really. The Bible has a word for it. And the word is pride. You see, Saul thought he could do it all by himself. And you and I, we think we can do it all by ourselves. We Respond to Jesus the same way that a determined two-year-old will, deter will respond to their parents. We will stomp their feet and say, no, I'll do it by myself. Let me do it by myself. And you know what happens. Something gets broken. When the child tries to do it by themselves, when they refuse to ask for help. So we in our pride, we in our arrogance refuse to declare Christ as Lord and we stomp our feet and tell Jesus we can do it by ourselves. And then we hit the iceberg. And you sink. Because you're just not that strong by yourself. You can't do it all alone. You were never intended to. Were you ever a lifeguard? Did you ever teach a child swimming lessons? The first three days are horrible. They're horrible. You're in the pool, time for swimming lessons, and the mother brings, most of the time it's mom, brings the little fella in for swimming lessons, and he has a death grip on mom. Every part of his body is holding on her. He's got his legs wrapped around her. He's choking her around the neck. She's trying to, like, like they glued together somehow. She's trying to peel him off. Finally, you get hold of the little fella, and he puts the death grip on you. Like he's got some kind of suction cup, and he is just on you. Now you're waist deep in the water, and you're trying to tell him, calm down. 
This is going to be fun. No, it's not. No, it's not. Yes, it's going to be fun. You're going to learn how to swim. No, I won't. No, I won't. I hate water. I hate water. I hate, I hate mama. I hate you. I hate everybody. Okay, it's all right. You're going to be all right. Listen. And you finally peel him off and you say, listen, relax. Relax. The first thing we're going to learn to do is float. The water will hold you up. No, I won't. No, I won't. I'm going to sink. No, you won't. The water will hold you up. I'm going to sink. I'm going to sink. I'm going to sink. Here, I'm going to let you go. Boom. <laughs> right to the bottom. <laughs> and you pull him up. You're going to, see, see, see. I almost drowned. I almost drowned. I almost, you didn't drown. It's right here. You'll be fine. Just relax. It takes you about three days of a week of swimming lessons to get the little fella to relax. Once they relax and learn to float, kicking your legs and moving your arms, that's easy. But the hardest thing in the world is to hold that child and say, now relax, relax, relax. I can't relax. You don't float that way. You have to relax. And finally, late Wednesday sometime, you can slide your hand out and show the child your hands and say you're floating. Of course, they sink immediately afterwards. Why is it that the hardest thing for you and me to, to understand is that Jesus will hold you up? You don't have to fight. You don't have to struggle. Jesus will hold you up. Relax. It's not about what you or I can do. It's about what Jesus has already done. It's not about how much you can get done. It's about what Christ wants to do through you. This divine energy, this, this life of the resurrection that is now alive in Christ, now wants to be born in you. And the thing you have to do is give up. Surrender. Quit trying to make your life something that it wasn't supposed to be. Quit trying to work so hard to justify that you're here. Christ loves you already. That's given. You can't do anything to make him love you more. You can't do anything to make him stop loving you. Oh, I know. You want to pull me aside here. You want to say, I know, Mike, that, that's the great story and stuff. But you don't know what happened in my life. You don't know about the mistake I made. You don't know about the, the, the foolish things I did. You don't know about the people I've hurt. You don't know about the places I can't go back to. You don't know anything like that. You know, Paul had that same feeling. He did. <laughs> and he wrote about it in his first letter to Timothy. Let me, let me show you what he wrote. See, sometimes you folks read the Bible too fast. And you, you just miss some great stuff. That's what he wrote. I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful and appointed me to his, to his ministry. One who was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man. But since I acted out of ignorance, I had enacted in unbelief, I received mercy and the grace of our Lord overflowed in my life. Along with the faith and love that we have in Christ Jesus, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. See what I told you about pride? See, he was the greatest Pharisee, and now since Jesus told him he was the worst, he was a sinner, he said, well, I must be the best sinner. Boy, had a problem with that pride, didn't he? I'm going to be number one somewhere, even if it's the worst. But I receive mercy because of this, and here's why. So that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate the utmost patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Do you see what he's saying? I, I know why I was saved, Paul writes Timothy. I, I know why Jesus came to me. It was because when people heard about my conversion, they would say, if Jesus can save him, Jesus can save anybody. He saved the one who persecuted him. He changed the one who was an enemy of the church. If Jesus can do that, Jesus can work in anybody's life. Paul said, once I fell to my knees and said, what do I do now, Lord? Everything changed for me. If he saved me, he can save you. And that same Jesus who confronted Paul 
now confronts you. This Lord of death, this Lord of life, now confronts you. Not in condemnation, not in judgment, but in a love that won't let you go. Telling you this one thing, relax. I'll hold you up. Don't fight me. I'll get you through. Give up trying to live your own life. Surrender to me. If I did it for Paul, I can do it for you.